Hey, welcome back once again, your CISSP wannabes. I am Colin Weaver. You are once again watching this IT Dojo CISSP questions of the day, where each time I come at you, I bring you two questions as I continue to help you prep for this dreaded CISSP exam. So today's questions are brought to you by the number 73, the Sheldon Prime. So let's get right into it. Okay, question number one, you are evaluating submissions from vendors for a piece of software for your order fulfillment center. Uh, my question for you is, as it pertains to cryptography, which of the following that I'm going to show you is the most important consideration? Uh, go ahead and give those a read. Think about it. Click pause if necessary. When you're ready, click play, and I will walk you through. First answer choice says that the RSA keys must be at least 2048 bits in length. While that is absolutely a good recommendation, I'm not entirely sure that's going to be the most important consideration. So let's set that one off to the side and keep looking at the other answer choices and see if maybe there's something better. But uh, not an incorrect statement, but is it the most important or the most important consideration? So let's keep looking. Choice number two says that vendor design symmetric algorithms should use at least 128 bit keys. Um, Gosh, there's several problems with that. The top of the list being that using a vendor designed algorithm is widely going to be regarded as a bad idea. Uh, really what this whole question is all about is the fact that cryptography is hard and doing cryptography well, even for cryptographers can be challenging. Anybody can write a cryptographic algorithm to go in and make data confidential, but whether or not it can stand up to all of the different types of attacks that are out there is a completely different story. Um, heck, even as proof of concept, I've written my own encryption algorithm, and I can assure you that it sucks in the grand scheme of encryption algorithms, although it certainly does make encrypted data. Uh, so I would never use that to actually secure anything that I really wanted to maintain secrecy on. So for you to use a vendor designed algorithm means that you are trusting really their in-house development of cryptography, and that is a no-no. So you're definitely not gonna wanna do that, which makes this answer choice horribly incorrect. So uh, stay away from this answer choice, stay away from proprietary vendor algorithm kind of things. You're gonna wanna use tried and true, well-known, understood, rigorously tested algorithms in your software, and you're gonna wanna make sure you stick to that pretty vigilantly. All right, all that stuff I just said makes choice number three seem pretty interesting. And that is that only peer-reviewed, well-known algorithms that are in the public space should really be considered for use. Um, this stuff ties in even with things like Kirchhoff's principle, which says that uh, the only thing that should be secret in a crypto system is the key. The, the mechanism, the algorithm should be well-known because the more well-known it is, the more sets of eyes have been able to be placed on it, the more rigorous the analysis and the vetting of that algorithm, the higher degree of assurance that we, the non-cryptographers of the world who need to benefit from cryptography without being mathematicians, um, are going to be able to go in and have a high degree of confidence and assurance that the algorithms that we're using are actually doing what we think they're doing. Uh, and that's critical. And the, the way to do that, one of the ways to do that is to make sure that you only use stuff that is well vetted and to stay away from homegrown cryptographic solutions. So number three is definitely the best choice, but just to be sure, the fourth choice says that uh, the algorithms have to be resistant to brute force attacks. That's totally a true statement. You very much want your algorithms to be resistant to brute force attacks. And uh, if you're using algorithms that are commonly available, pretty much all of them are going to be resistant to brute force attacks, provided the key is of sufficient length. Um, most attacks that we were concerned about with crypto systems today really aren't brute force attacks. In fact, when you're dealing with key links, like you get up to into the realm with AES and triple DES and things like that, for somebody to try and brute force those things, uh, barring computers that I'm unaware of existing, uh, it's an exercise in futility. They're going to look for another way to attack the crypto system. Uh, to go in and try and just do it via brute force is, is a waste of time in the grand scheme of life. So don't expect that people are going to really come at you that way. It's not that they might not try, but the likelihood of them being successful is pretty small. Okay, let's move on to question number two. Question number two today is, which of the following is a steganography technique used for hiding data? Okay. There's your answer choices. Look them over, pick the right one. If you had to click pause to read them, click on pause and I will talk about each one. Choice number one says that you are going to implement steganography by hiding data in the unallocated space on a disk. And that's just a big old no. So the unallocated space on a disk is the portion of a disk that currently does not have any data written to it 
as the file system on that disk sees it. It does not mean that there's not data there. It could have been data that was there and it has been deleted and the file system no longer has pointers to it, but uh, it could also just as well be empty space. But hiding your data there is not steganography. I guess you could put data there, but there's no guarantee that your data is going to stay there because it could get overwritten pretty much at any moment. So no, not the right answer choice. How about choice number two? You go in and you hide data in the slack space of a file. Now, that is not steganography, but it is a way of hiding data. Um, by going in and saying you are dealing with a disk that uses, say, four kilobyte clusters and you've only written two kilobytes of data, um, then you have a four kilobyte cluster that's allocated using only two kilobytes of data, which means that the other two kilobytes in that four kilobyte cluster are called the slack space. And you can actually store things in that slack space. The challenge to you as a, uh, somebody who's malicious or somebody who just wants to hide some data is that when you put data in slack space, there's, there's no protections on it. So if the file that was occupying that cluster were to increase in size, it's gonna overwrite your data that you've hidden in that slack space. So if you're gonna do this, then it would be wise for you to choose files that are unlikely to change. Uh, you know, say system files and things like that that don't get updated very often. That would be a better place for you to go in and put this stuff. Uh, and there are tools that do it, but it is not considered to be a steganographic mechanism. So uh, even though this is a way of hiding data, it's not the answer choice that we're looking for right here. All right, choice number three says you are going to implement steganography by hiding data in the unallocated sectors of a sparse file. And this is also no, not the way you do it. Um, a sparse file is a file that is, per the system, a particular size, but because it does not actually occupy that full size, the, uh, the portions of it that would otherwise be all zeros are actually just not allocated. And so we only allocate them as they are needed. Probably the most common place that any of us encounter this today is in the world of virtual machines. And if you do any desktop virtualization, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about because you see this when you create your VMs on a regular basis and enterprise virtualization too. But you go in and you create a virtual hard disk that's say 50 gigabytes in size, but you don't pre-allocate that disk space. You go in and say that that 50 gigabyte hard drive is allocated 50 gigabytes, but because it only occupies four gigabytes on the disk, then it's only gonna actually be four gigabytes in size, even though it's still a 50 gigabyte hard drive. And as the size of data that's on that virtual hard drive increases, we will actually allocate that space on an as needed basis. Uh, that's how sparse files work. And they can be very uh, you know, conservation friendly in terms of disk space utilization. Um, but putting data in the unallocated space of a sparse file, no, um, it's not something that's done partially because that space is not allocated. It's, it exists from a metadata perspective, but it's not actually allocated on the disk. And so there's no way for you to hide things in space that's not allocated. Uh, and even if you could do such a thing, it still wouldn't really be considered steganography because you know, we're not hiding data inside of other data at that point. So that leaves us with the last choice. And that one says that you are going to insert data into the least significant bits of an image file. And this is very much one of the steganographic techniques that's out there where you go in and you take an image that is comprised of you know, colors and then you go in and you change the least significant bit of the binary value that represents that color, replacing that bit with your actual data. The end result of which is that you can actually embed a file inside of an image without actually changing the image in a way that's really perceptible. And there's a ton of different steganographic tools that are out there that you can go in and mess around with this with. Uh, and it's actually really quite cool. Um, but uh, it, it's not super common from a day-to-day -day basis kind of perspective unless you're trying to do some kind of a digital watermark or something like that. Uh, but we are concerned about it from the perspective of an attacker using it, say, for the purposes of exfiltration or for covert communications or something like that. Um, but that's the answer choice that we're looking for here is to go and use that least significant bit of something like a JPEG to go in and actually hide your data inside the actual image itself without visually changing the image in a way that the human eye is going to be able to detect. So that's it. All right, two more questions down. Hope you enjoyed them. Uh, the number 73 thanks you for being here. If you're not sure why 73 is a Sheldon prime and why it's such an awesome prime number, Google that junk and let me know in the comments how cool you think the number 73 is. Uh, because I think it's pretty cool. Anyway, I will see you again. Bye.